But about the camera, Brad and Bob Bates flew onto the Walsh Glacier uh, June 18th of 1937. Uh, Brad wanted to climb Mount Lucania, would have been a, was a first ascent. Uh, he, wanted, he was a member of the Harvard Mountaineering Club, and there's an absolutely wonderful story called Escape from Lucania by you know, our friend David Roberts that describes all of this. Um, it was a four-person expedition. They flew out of Valdez on you know, one of these 1937 airplanes where Bob Reeves had mounted skids to take off on the mud flats, land on the glacier, and then fly back. And Brad and uh, Bob Bates were on the first team. They'd already dropped off a couple of thousand pounds of gear on the glacier. Um, you, it's hard to see the scale, but that's about eight miles to the ridge and then further to the summit. They'd done an aerial survey. They thought they could do this, but a month-long expedition. And the airplane got stuck in warm snow. And for about a week, Bob Reeves couldn't take off. And there were multiple attempts. And, you know, and he is deathly afraid, was deathly afraid of crevasses. So he wouldn't stray far from the airplane. And they kept digging out the plane. And it would run uphill and then turn around, try and take off not get enough speed, and he'd stop, and the wing would dip down into the snow, and they'd have to dig it out. An amazing story. And finally, Bob Reeves, the temperature drops, figures he can get out, is very light loaded. Of course, you know, I'm sure everybody in Valdez and, and Barbara were very worried at this point because they hadn't heard word one, and planes did crash back then. Finally, he makes it out and basically says to, to Brad and Bob, you know, see ya. I'm not coming back for you, and I'm not bringing your buddies in. You know, Brad and Bob had to decide you know, do we hike out, you know, 100 miles or so down the Walsh Glacier, or do we go ahead and climb and then try and go out over the other side, which they didn't have maps for, by the way. Uh, you know, this is, there weren't a lot, to uh, Burwash Landing, which was a trading post near Clane Lake. In the, um, so here's, here's Alaska, the Yukon, what's now the wrangell St. Elias Range, and this is Mount Lacania. And, a, uh, this bigger map is a, uh, zooming in on that. And in fact, they did that. They, they decided to cut back on the gear because there were only two of them. They shuttled it up to a pass that they named Shangri-La where they established a camp. They climbed Lucania. They climbed Mount Steele. Over the top of Steele, down an extremely steep face, and they assumed they would then you know, just hike out. And they knew from the journals that there was a cache from a previous attempt with beans and, you know, all, you know, and all kinds of food. And uh, so they made this great ascent. And Brad had this camera and, and took wonderful pictures. Bob and Brad dearly hoped that once they left base camp, they would never see it again. This meant that before hauling their loads up the glacier, they would have to sort through the mountainous cache, deciding on the spot which items to abandon. What it grieved Brad most to leave behind was his large format Fairchild F8 aerial camera, which exposed five by seven inch negatives. Many of the pictures we see here at the museum are taken with that camera. The first of a series of heavy and expensive apparatus with which Washburn would capture his matchless aerial images of the mountains of Alaska and the Yukon. He was determined to carry and use a lighter camera, his Zeiss Icon Maximar, for no matter how trying the circumstances, Brad had already developed a burning passion to bring back good pictures from every one of his expeditions. The excuses of other explorers who captured only poorly focused, sorry, poorly exposed out of focus images of their deeds would form a source of lifelong scorn for Washburn. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind when we get to the pictures I took. Um, that's why I read that passage. So. So they had this incredible adventure trying to get out. They got down to the cache, and bears had basically ripped it all to shreds. There was nothing left. And they had already thrown away most of their food, counting on, uh, to get down the steep slope, counting on having food at the cache. Before they left the summit, Brad was determined to take a team portrait. It was not an easy task. From the zero degree air, his ice camera had frozen. He found that he could make the shutter work only at 1 200th of a second. No problem. Brad tied the camera to the top of his axe with a shoelace, got himself and Bob into position, and activated the self-timer. The summit photo from Lucania on July 9, 1937, was the best taken to date on any mountain top in Alaska or in the Yukon. Just to continue this story, they finally get down to the shores of the Donjek River uh, on their way out. 
and it's you know over 100 feet wide, glacier-fed Alaskan River in July, and they were convinced that if they crossed it, they would both perish. So they decided that to get that 100 yards or so, they would add 25 miles to their trip by just going up to the Donjek Glacier and cross at the source. They'd go up and over the glacier. Of course, they'd gotten rid of their hobnailed boots and their ice axes by then, and they did. They went you know, all the way up glacier, and they found that, in fact, the source of the Donjek River is not the Donjek Glacier, and that it makes a turn and is fed by another glacier, but they were able to make their way across and then ford what was left of the river all the way back down, uh, and at this point, you know, they're really in incredibly desperate straits. So this is not Lucania, but it's the Yukon from the internet, taken from the International Space Station to give you what kind of terrain this is. And in 1937, you know, it was truly wild and, and relatively uncharted. And here's uh, Brad and Bob Bates on the summit of Mount Lucania, taken with that uh, Zeiss Icon Maxim RB camera. Uh, and it's really a wonderful photograph. There's a, it's a part of a bigger photograph. But so, so this is Brad, for those of you who don't know him, and Bob Bates. Um, you know, really an incredible expedition. So they finally make it down that you have to ask, how did I get the camera? Because whether they were simply worn out from the marathon effort of the previous day or had begun to weaken from consuming barely adequate provisions, on the morning of the 14th, the men found carrying their 60-pound loads nearly intolerable. Uh, both had noticed that they'd lost a lot of weight uh, for their trousers hung loose on their hips. They decided once more to check out some of their baggage, or at least to leave it in a cache in the forlorn hope of being able to retrieve it in some distant future. To that end, they hung one of the two pack boards in a tree near the Donjek. This is after the 25 miles up and back. With every last piece of clothing they thought they could do without. They were already sharing a sleeping bag for several days. And most agonizing of all, Brad Zeiss' camera and all his exposed film. Now on the summit, he used his last film pack. So on the way down, they didn't have any ability to document what they were doing. In that abandonment, there was also a first hint of the pair's darkest thoughts about the upcoming days. For as the men left the cache, Brad said, now at least they'll know what happened to us. Bob understood at once. Should the two of them vanish in their effort to escape, some hunter or mountaineer, perhaps years hence, might come across the cache, retrieve the film, get it developed, and thereby apprehend all but the very end of the story of the first ascent of Mount Lucania. Um, you know, once American Alpine Club gave me the camera and I read that story, uh, you know, I could not believe that I was in possession of this camera and that my hopes were that it would have a really exciting voyage. Um, and so this is you know, me in front of that Apollo engine uh, with the camera. And my first challenge was, if the film packs went out in the 70s, how could I take a picture with it? Now, the camera flying up and back would probably be historic enough, but Brad would certainly want me to take pictures with it, uh, and to have Brad's camera was fantastic, but no film packs. So, uh, you know, I'm not somebody who shops on eBay, but I became one. So, and, uh, and another couple hundred bucks later, I came up with a film back that was designed for the camera. Now, I was successful in getting the camera on board, but not the film. And again, it was this policy thing that the camera's one item, I had a second item, and then the film would have been, you know, three, four, five, whatever the number is. So when our October flight got delayed, I had an opportunity. Um, I bought the film. I agreed that NASA would then own the film and all the rights to the pictures, which fortunately is in the public domain. So everybody would own the pictures. But NASA likes to hold on to the film so it doesn't get damaged and future generations can use it. And all of that worked out great. And finally, you know, I found the right person who with a single signature could manifest the film, and it, and it became very easy, but it, it was a, a bit of a struggle. Uh, so on goes the film, and the camera itself, because it was sort of large, had to be combined with the other object I had, and so in this special locker was a 1908-1909 flattened basketball crushed sort of like a bowl, and the camera rode inside of it, and it was Edwin Powell Hubble's, the astronomer's, championship basketball from the University of Chicago in a game against Indiana. Uh, University of Chicago was uh, national champions 1908-1909 and 1909-1910. Edwin Hubble was a point guard and became the most influential American astronomer of the last century. So, so anyway, so Brad's camera rode up with Hubble's basketball. <laughs>